I'll be speaking about aquatic macroinvertebrate sampling methods for non-regulatory programs. Water quality monitoring is used by many different programs, and it may involve sampling such as water samples, fish, algae, bacteria, and aquatic macroinvertebrates, which is the focus of this talk. Doing water quality monitoring can be expensive and time consuming for different programs. It involves time in the field, time in the lab, picking samples out of debris, and doing identifications. The degree of sampling needed depends on the purpose of a program. For example, a state environmental agency does water quality state, uh, stamp monitoring for um, submission to the EPA. And that's a very specific sampling protocol. It's a very specific program with methods that are consistent with what the EPA requires. And then a permittee will have a permit for an action. And as part of their permit, they also have to do water quality assessments. And that has to be consistent with that state environmental agency. Sometimes water quality sampling is used to then roll that information into species cataloging. For example, the all taxa bio inventory that was done at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Or it may be that a researcher is using water quality assessments to answer a particular research question. And that research question may not require a regulatory protocol. So it may be that only a portion of the protocol or a portion of the data is used. And lastly, just general water quality monitoring by a non-regulatory program to be sure that a resource is being protected and managed correctly. And this may be from land managers such as the National Park Service or a state resource agent that, agency that doesn't have a regulatory charge. And so they're doing water quality um, metrics and measurements for various reasons that are non-regulatory. But they often use regulatory pr protocols because those protocols are available. They're publicly um, accessible. It's been vetted. And, and they know that they can get a quality method that other people have trusted. However, um, they're sampling to a level that may not be necessary. Um, it's not having to meet that regulatory bar. And they need to ensure water quality but they're also operating under tightening budgets that may not have sufficient funds allocated to really do a regulatory size assessment on their water resources. So can protocols be modified or reduced to give similar water quality data for them to be able to really keep an eye on their resource, but with less cost for these programs? This picture um, shows, it's an example of a regulatory water quality method. So this reflects what was done at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And this is where I did um, the study that I'm talking about today, which is part of a larger project. But Great Smoky Mountains National Park has a protocol that mirrors North Carolina's. And then I mirrored what the Smokies was doing, so everything was consistent. But one thing that came up as I began working with the park was that they were really having a hard time finding the right answer for their program um, to really keep getting good water quality data, but work with these budgets that are being reduced over time and, and struggling to have the people hours to get everything done. So this protocol has six different sampling methods, and I'll go in a little bit more detail um, later on. And each method is repeated three times over the course of a hundred meter reach of a stream. So can reduced sampling methods provide similar water quality data compared to doing all of those methods, that full bioassessment? That is, this question um, we answer in two steps. First, take each sampling method individually, the six that I just showed on the previous slide, and compare different metrics among those six different sampling methods to identify which ones should stay and which ones should maybe go. And then second step would be to take the metrics that we want to keep and do different combinations of the metrics, the different combinations of the sampling methods. So we chose three combinations, 
those combinations have fewer sampling methods and compare those to doing the full bioassessment with six methods to see if we're able to get similar water quality data, but use less effort, less sampling, and hopefully that would transfer to less expense. Indicator taxa, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies were identified for this study. And this occurred in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This was part of a larger study. So um, all of the points were not considered in this study. Note the yellow downstream. This is downstream from a hemlock forest. And so all of the yellow spots are where the data is taken from. And this is located throughout the national park. These streams are in mountainous areas. They're higher gradient streams. So the results of this study really apply to similar streams, um, these rocky mountain streams um, that have higher gradients. It would not be really appropriate to transfer this information directly to like a coastal plain stream just because the systems are very different. For each sampling method, starting with kick nets. So a kick net is put downstream from a riffle and then someone comes upstream and disturbs that riffle. And we did this for a set amount of time for all the samples. So everything's either standardized by time or area. And so somebody will kick this up and the debris and the insects will flow downstream into the net. And then everything that the net collect collects is preserved in ethanol and taken to the lab. And then um, researchers have to pick the insects out of the debris, which takes quite a long time for kick net samples. So that one does have a good bit more lab handling time and D-nuts do as well. But this study doesn't specifically account for time sorting in the lab, but that's something to keep in mind thinking through these processes. And then D-nets, um, a similar concept, the substrate is disturbed, but this is a specific habitat. It's a depositional area on the side of the stream. Where there's lots of sandy, silty type materials and that is disturbed and the net goes through it. Um, it still picks up a lot of the finer materials that don't pass through the net that is preserved and taken back to the lab. Next is rock wash. And so this involves taking a bucket and taking 10 stones found in the stream. These can be taken from higher flow and lower flow areas, submerging a stone, washing it off, manually disturbing the stone to dislodge the insects. And so that's done with 10 stones. And then what's left in the water, insects and a little bit of debris is run through a sieve. And then what's in the sieve is taken back to the lab. And that's much less material than a kick net or a D-net typically collects as far as having things to pick through in the lab. Leaf pack is similar to a rock wash. A standard amount of leaf material, 10 cubic centimeters, is submerged in a bucket of water. The leaves are agitated and shaken in the water to dislodge the insects. And all that water is poured through a sieve. Sand samples are for a particular part of the habitat. It is a depositional area in high flow. So it's usually close to the middle of the stream and these little pockets of sand and very fine gravel. The triangle net is put downstream. The sandy area is disturbed and whatever is dislodged flows into the net. It's preserved in ethanol and taken to the lab. And lastly, visual collections. This is a time collection where a person will move around the stream and try to key in on habitats that may not have been sampled by the other sampling method, such as woody debris and flat slabs of stone with water flowing over it. And that being said, it still does involve things like turning over rocks and picking insects off the rocks as well. And these samples only really contain the insects and so there's not picking through at all on this one. You just pull the insects, store them into the group, different groups and you're ready to go on identifications. Step one, the six different sampling methods, four different response variables, abundance, so the total number of bugs in a collected a stream, richness, the total number of types of macroinvertebrates, EPT, collected at a stream. Shan diversity is just a general measure of diversity and the effort ratio. And this is the abundance divided by the richness, or the total number of bugs divided by the total number of types of bugs collected. And this is to get some kind of a handle on how much effort does it take to go through these samples and how much do we get return on that effort. So if I'm going to identify one insect and for every new type of insect I add, how many bugs do I have to touch, have under the scope and identify? Helps us know 
you know, how that effort is being allocated and, and when we're, we're getting the best return. And they were analyzed by ANOVA with two keys mean separation and when needed, log transformed. So a method that would give us, would be one that we would wanna keep in, look for lower abundance and consequently lower effort ratio. So not having to go through a lot of material to get the data and then higher richness and higher Shannon diversity. So keep that in mind as we walk through the next slides. And then step two, we've, we'll have eliminated a couple of sampling methods in step one. And then all six methods, the full bioassessment will be compared to doing three different combinations. And those combinations will have a reduced set of sampling methods. Same response variable, same analysis, and in that, comparison, we want something that has a lower abundance and a lower effort ratio than using all six methods, and something that also produces similar richness and similar Shannon diversity. Specimens were identified um, mostly to genus, about 70%. 17% were identified to family, and that was based on taxonomic difficulty, or for instance, with the leptophlebiid uh, mayflies, their gills fell off and transit back to the lab and we were not able to identify them. And then a few that were very easy were taken to species. Mostly these we would see done to genus or family level for most water quality purposes. Total of 4,980 insects were identified. 87 were EPT taxa. Richness from everything collected at each stream ranged from 18 to 36 taxa per stream and that's just EPT taxa and abundance ranged from 109 to 915 EPT collected at each stream. 915 is a lot. So some sampling methods do um, use ways to subsample. Um, the method that we were mirroring did not, so that wasn't done in the study, but that would be something for programs to consider as they move forward and may do some methods development in the future. Starting out with richness, on the y-axis and the different sampling methods on the x-axis. Kicknet and rock wash have very similar, statistically similar values of richness. So 16 compared to about 13 um, taxa detected using rock wash and kicknet. Visual was a bit lower, but similar um, to rock wash. And that was a surprise for me. I wasn't expecting to collect so many different things with that simple five minute visual sample. DNET did have less, but that's expected. It's that very specific depositional habitat. And then sand sample and leaf pack um, <clears throat> getting lower richness with that as well. Um, so that's kind of giving us a, a first look at how things are, are performing. We, we knew that KickNet would do very well. That is a sampling method that is just standard for water quality protocol. We get a lot of material with it, but we also get a lot of different taxa with it. Abundance, the total number of insects collected by that method. It is the highest for kicknet, although rock wash and leaf pack are statistically similar, but on average about 200 collected with a kicknet and less than 100 for rock wash and leaf pack. And then visual and DNET are trailing a little bit and sand sample with the lowest abundance. Shannon diversity was similar among all the sampling methods except for leaf pack. So leaf pack did not perform well as far as diversity and is lower than everything else. And lastly, effort ratio, right? So where are we getting the best return on our time? The effort ratio is highest numerically for kicknet, although statistically similar to rock wash and leaf pack. And then the DNET, sand sample, and visual are having lower at Effort ratio, remember that visual did give us a bit higher richness. So um, it's doing that with a lower effort ratio. Leaf pack had a higher effort ratio. It also had higher abundance and it had lower diversity. So it's, we're kind of getting the hint that leaf pack may not be a strong player here. Let's look at everything together. Sand samples, low richness, you know, low abundance and low effort ratio, but we're also not getting much only getting about five species per stream with that sampling method. And then leaf pack 
lower richness, um, relatively a moderate amount of abundance, lower Shannon diversity, and quite high effort ratio for what we're getting from that sample. <clears throat> so let's remove these two sampling methods and take the next step and go with things that are stronger candidates. Keeping, keeping KitNet in, it does have higher abundance and higher effort ratio, um, but not statistically different than rock wash, and it's one to keep considering. So three different sampling combinations, KickNet and Visual. All right, so we'll have a little more processing time with KickNet, Visual, a little processing time, DNet, rock wash, and Visual. Um, so again, a little more processing time, but that's not specifically being addressed, but something to keep in mind. And then rock wash and Visual, um, which would have very low processing time, um, but we're not getting like the additional species that we may be picking up with a DNet. And then those combinations compare to doing the full six method bioassessment. And so first start with richness. And richness is similar among the first two combinations and all of the methods, um, but it is significantly lower using rock wash and visual, just those two methods does give us lower richness However, it's important to point out these, this is two sampling methods and three sampling methods, and it's still able to give us you know, similar richness, a comparison of you know, 20 or 22 compared to 25 or 26. So that's not bad at all. Let's take the next step and look at abundance. All methods is statistically higher than the others, and that is expected. It's a combination of much more sampling methods, but there's not a statistically significant difference among the three methods down here. So um, there is some variation. Um, but we're not really seeing anything pull out as, as performing much better as far as abundance is concerned. Not much of a story for Shannon diversity. I'll switch back to abundance. One thing I will point out is that KickNet Visual ends up collecting about 55% of the specimens compared, compared to all methods. And then Rock Wash, DNet, and Visual, it's only 33% of what would be collected by all methods, but it does provide similar richness. So that's really important to note. And then lastly, effort ratio. And so all methods do produce um, that results in the highest effort ratio is statistically higher than all of the other groups. And then all the other groups are very similar. Um, you can maybe draw some implications, but we don't have anything statistically significant to you know, step out on. Um, but promising results, and it's good to see that using fewer methods can give us very similar richness and diversity. So in consideration for non-regulatory water quality monitoring um, and anyone else who would want to draw information from this, this does provide data to um, support decisions where programs are having to reduce some of those sampling methods. The first two combinations, KickNet and Visual and DNet, Rockwash and Visual perform very well and similarly to using all methods combined as far as richness and diversity. Um, so that's encouraging. Can these protocols be modified or reduced to give similar water quality data with less costs? And the answer to that is yes. Um, I would suggest the combinations below as a starting point in consideration. Great Smoky Mountains National Park is in the process of revising their protocols based on the study that we did with them. Um, Becky Nichols is their aquatic entomologist, and she is a co-author on this work, and that protocol is now in review um, just to run it through and to be sure that we're using the right amount of rigor and that we're developing methods that are appropriate. And having numbers to assess those different methods and how they work together is a great beginning of that process. I'd like to thank Great Smoky Mountains National Park, University of Tennessee, and the United States Forest Service for funding, and the taxonomist listed for their assistance with verifying my identifications. Thank you for your time.